What's going on, guys? It's Jimmy here. We got a lot going on here with the Israel-Hamas-Gaza war. Also, we have the U.S. House of Representatives speaker vote is expected to start Tuesday at noon. We will see how it will go because it might <laughs> have to go several rounds. Even though Ohio Republican Representative Jim Jordan is expected to be the front runner, that does not mean that Matt Gates and his small party that ousted Kevin McCarthy will actually vote for him. So we will see if we have a united Republican Party. We will see. You can let me know your thoughts in the comments. Also, surprise, surprise, <laughs> Russian President Vladimir Putin, Putin is very critical of Israel, even um, likening Israel to World War II's Germany, Hitler. Gee, imagine that. Next thing you know, he'll be calling the Isra uh, Israelis Nazis, just like he does with Ukraine. Apparently, Netanyahu has spoken with Russian, with, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. So I wouldn't hold your breath on this, but a lot of people think that Putin is possibly behind the attacks from Hamas and thinks that he may have been the one that funded Hamas in the first place. Because if he funds Hamas, remember they had 2,000 missiles on day one alone, and then subsequent more in the days afterwards, where did they even get all these missiles and all this funding? And now it's been days of attacks since then. And, of course, we know that Iran helps fund Hamas and Hezbollah. And Iran and Russia are trading partners and allies. We know Iran and Russia are helping each other out as well. So if Russia and Iran and now the United States has to help or does help Israel... This significantly weakens the United States with supplying more ammunition to Israel and military supplies to Israel and NATO helping Israel. This weakens the war for Ukraine and the help for Ukraine. Vladimir Putin knows this. So if they were all sitting around at a table in Russia strategizing how to help the Russian cause for their war that has been going on for 20 months now. This was probably a pretty good plan for Vladimir Putin. You guys can let me know your thoughts here on this. And if you went to Hamas or uh, the terrorist group over there uh, or and or Hezbollah and said, hey, you know that thousand year war you've been fighting? What if we gave you several thousand missiles to help your cause? Would you want them for free? You guys can let me know your thoughts here in the comments. But this is what a lot of people have been thinking that uh, Iran slash Russia were the funders, people funding Hamas for this. Where did they get the money? Where did they get the missiles for this all of a sudden? Also, I found this interesting. Russia's likely death toll in Ukraine revealed in a government filing from Russia. You guys can let me know your thoughts on this. Uh, I don't know if this is an oopsie from Russia or just weren't paying attention or don't care. But take a look at this. Russia's proposed 2024 budget allocates funding to the families of 102,700 military personnel killed in Ukraine. So almost 103,000 
military personnel killed in Ukraine, giving insight into Moscow's likely death toll into Russian President Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine that began in February 2022, over 20 months ago. The figures, which has not been independently verified by Newsweek, were reported on Thursday by independent Russian news outlet Mozham Oibensnit, which analyzed Russia's federal budget draft for 2024 to 2026. I'm sure you can look this up if you want to independently verify it. The publication notes that in addition to one-time insurance payments for military personnel killed in Ukraine, relatives also receive monthly compensation of 21,922 and 12 rubles or a total of $225 from the Social Fund of Russia. I guess that's what a live is going for if you're killed in action for in Ukraine for, you know, fighting for Vladimir Putin. For the 2024 budget, the government has allocated 16.3 billion rubles to relatives of military personnel who were injured or died. Of this figure, 9.9 billion rubles is allocated, which is about $102 million, which doesn't sound like that much in dollars, is allocated for monthly payments to the relatives of soldiers who experienced trauma. The remaining budget, $59 million, is set to be paid to the families of killed military personnel, which in dollars is not much at all, with 550 million rubles or only $5 million set aside to repair homes. Wow, that's like nothing. I mean, in the U.S., one home costs that much in California. Wow. Meanwhile, Anthony Blinken meets with uh, Israel President and uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promises U.S. support. Many people think the U.S. will be involved in this war more and more and growing U.S. presence in the region. Take a look here. And the U.S. is expanding its military presence near the Middle East as a show of force. A second aircraft carrier is now on its way to the eastern Mediterranean. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze joins me now from the Pentagon with more on that. Elizabeth, what do we know about this second aircraft carrier? Hey, Diane. Well, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin ordered the USS Eisenhower to depart for the eastern Mediterranean. That order was on Saturday, and it'll take about a week to arrive. This is a massive show of firepower from the U.S. It comes along with the USS Ford, which is already in that region. And really what it's aimed to do, Diane, is send a message of deterrence. In addition to that aircraft carrier, it also includes missile interceptors. There's firepower to aim to show a message to especially Iran that the U.S. is there in the region and they don't want this to escalate. Why send these ships there now? Who is this show of force aimed at? Right, so Iran and Hezbollah. And that message has been explicit from Defense Secretary Austin. In the statement, he said that this is aimed to show that any hostile actor that's trying to take advantage of what we're seeing between Israel and Hamas just don't. And that's something we've heard across the administration, Diane, this, this attempt to try to say the U.S. is backing Israel's defense right now. It doesn't want any other actor, especially Hezbollah, with those clashes that we've seen in northern Israel between Hezbollah and, and Israeli forces. Really what the U.S. wants to try to do is, is say, do not take advantage of this moment to try to get this escalated uh, any further. Diane. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is also actively working to ensure the people of Gaza can get out of harm's way and get the assistance they need. So what message is the U.S. conveying to Israel about avoiding civilian casualties? You know, and, and publicly, the, the message from Secretary Blinken and President Biden and across the administration is that the U.S. fully supports the right of Israel to defend itself against the atrocious attacks by Hamas. But, of course, there is this question of, as Hamas has escalated its airstrikes, and, we, and we've been talking about it, that humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the human loss of life, and how do you avoid those civilian lives lost? And essentially, what Secretary Blinken said is, 
he understands and hopes and expects that Israel will continue to follow the rules of war, the international rules of law that would minimize human life losses. And, and we saw in a statement, Secretary Blinken said overnight that he, that he hopes that the U.S. can continue to provide the aid that's needed to people in Gaza. So that's food, that's water, that's continued uh, support uh, for hospitals that have, have, had, have said that they need help. But ultimately, getting that aid there, continuing to be a sticking point, getting those humanitarian corridors opened up, not exactly clear how the administration is going to be able to do that. It's not, you know, at this point, Diane. Now, Egypt's president has accused Israel of collective punishment and has made clear that he doesn't want refugees from Gaza flooding into his country. So what else has come out of Blinken's meetings with Arab leaders and what's the solution here? Well, and these have been tense exchanges between Secretary Blinken and some of those other Arab leaders. We understand that the meeting with Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he left Blinken waiting for hours before it even started. In the meeting with Egypt's president, uh, you know, we the exchange was very obviously tense. And part of the reason for that, Diane, is that these Arab leaders are calling for a de-escalation. They want, in many ways, a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And that's not something that the Biden administration is backing right now. The Biden administration continues to say that Israel has a right to continue this, these strikes against Hamas. And, and until that kind of positioning changes, we're going to continue to see those clashes and at least kind of a sense of tense uh, interactions between these diplomats at the highest level, like Secretary of State Blinken and some of those Arab leaders. So I will keep you up to date here. If you haven't yet, subscribe down below. Click the bell icon so you don't miss out on any new videos that come out here every day on our YouTube channel at 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for liking and sharing these videos. Click here to see the war warning that China just gave to the U.S. Or click here to see why Biden just pissed off Iran. Click on one of those videos next. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.